This episode is in partnership with British luxury yacht manufacturer, Princess Yachts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new motorsport podcast series. I'm Ed Foster, and this time we're turning our attention to Porsche. The series is called Porsche's Winning Formula. Ever since Ferdinand Porsche designed the Volkswagen Beetle in 1939, eight years after launching his eponymous company in 1931, Porsche has been at the forefront of vehicle design. While the pretty 356 was the first car to carry the Porsche name in the late 1950s, many of you will automatically think of the 911 that arrived over 10 years later. Arguably the most successful sports car of all time. The model is still being built nearly 60 years later. In those years, Porsche has won the Le Mans 24 hours more than any other manufacturer. It's been victorious in Formula One, both as a constructor and an engine supplier, and it's won countless GT championships with its beloved 911. Porsches have even done rallycross and rallying. In this special podcast series, we are going to speak to the racers that are at the forefront of the German manufacturer's racing development and key names from the road car side to get a better idea of how this great company has had so much success for so long. Brian Redmond, a very warm welcome uh, from sunny Scotland all the way to the United States of America. And thank you so much for joining us uh, in our podcast series called Porsche's Winning Formula. Thank you. A great pleasure. It's uh, going back a long time, isn't it, now since I started with Porsche in 1969. Yeah, well, I, there's so much to talk about in your career, and I obviously sort of before this, I was I was looking, you know, looking through it again, and um, I actually I came across some career stats for you, and you did in your professional career, you did 358 races, you got 94 wins or class wins, and you finished in the top three 177 times. Wow, that's is, impressive. <laughs> it is. It, I mean, it really is. And then, I mean, you know, looking at the big sports car wins, Targa Florio, Daytona 24 hours twice, uh, twice at the Nürburgring 1,000 kilometers, and then four times at the Spa 1,000 kilometers when you didn't really, you sort of even like Spa. Well, I mean, Spa for me, you know, I've often heard it said by, you know, famous drivers that uh, the Nürburgring was the most difficult track. But to me, Spa was much more difficult. The Nürburgring, you could learn every inch of it, and I knew it, you know, like the back of my hand. And there weren't very many really high-speed sections, but at Spa, ah, you know, I mean, in the 917, we're doing 200 miles an hour. I mean, most of the time, they use first gear at the hairpin, not so much. And then after that, at Lecum, at the top of the hill, third gear, and then fourth and fifth, sorry, fourth, because certainly 917, as we raced it, it had four speeds, not five, that's per the original one. So you were into top gear all the time until you got back to the hairpin at last night. <laughs> so. Amazing. But you, I think, didn't I hear somewhere that you were four seconds a lap faster around Spa than Sifat or Rodriguez, but no one ever told you in case you asked for more money? <laughs> yeah, that, that was in John uh, Horseman's uh, book. <laughs> yes. Entirely accurate because part of Rodriguez and Sifford's times were when it was damp at the start of the race, whereas when I went out, it was dry. So I don't want to claim undue. Well, still overly modest, I would say. But you had a sort of a love hate relationship with Spa because I think I read somewhere that you, before you raced there, you hated it, and but when you left the circuit, you loved it. Yes, because you know, the night before the race, um. You know, I never slept. I'd lie there on in the bed, perspiring, thinking, you know, tomorrow I'm dead. I did. And so to finish the race and to do well in the race, it was in many ways a very lucky circuit for me, which is crazy. But I also won the last race of the two-litre championship in 1970 in the Chevron B16 Spider, uh, taking the lead from Joe Bonnier on the last corner of the last lap. <laughs> so it was actually five runs at Spa. And uh, strangely, uh, you know, looking back at it all, because we know now that the long tail Porsche, the L8, as it was called, that we won with in 1969, and the 917 both suffered from a not low, they didn't have any downfalls. And so just over a year after setting the fastest lap in the 1,000 gates in the 908 LH uh, that Joe Sippert and I won in, 
in this little uh, 1.8 litre Cosworth B, not FVC, FVC, 1.8 litre, about 240 horsepower, this little chevron went three seconds faster than I'd gone the previous year in the long tail portion. Crazy. But now, so now we know that in fact the 9083 that was built only for the Targa Florio and the Nürburgring would have been faster at Spa than the 908 long tail. Crazy. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we're going to come on and talk about the 908 and you know the Targa and um, and, the, and the 917 as well. But I've actually I've got a question here from Tim Rollett. Um, <clears throat> who thoroughly enjoyed reading your autobiography um, a while back, especially the chapters where he reminisced about his time living in the village of Gargrave in the Yorkshire Dales, not far from where he lives in Leeds. In the book, Brian describes the time he sold the 917 to Richard Atwood for £30,000. Uh, Brian recalled that he had trouble getting the Porsche started and had to tow it to the top of a nearby hill and push it down the road to get it going. Yes. My question is, can Brian recall which hill the Porsche was pushed down, please? I'd love to know, as I do a lot of walking around Gargrave. Also, can Brian remember which was his favourite pub? <laughs> well, the Mason's Arms in Gongrave was my favourite pub. And the hill was, if you turned out of Gargrave, going to, towards, let's say, towards West Martin area, you'd go up the hill, and that went past our house. Tara House was on the corner there. And so we towed it backwards up this hill on the road, a two-lane road, because the clutch was down. And I hadn't started it in 12 months. My oldest friend in the world, Ian Green, who came from Burnley, and his parents bought my parents' house when I was one year old. And so this was Ian Green, who lives in America also now. He said, does it run? And I said, I don't know. So it fired it up and it, it ran. But of course, the clutch was seized through lack of use. So using my land road, we towed it backwards up the hill. So it's facing down towards Gargrave now. And I shouted, let go, and he let go. The engine was running. And when I felt that it was a very suitable speed, I pushed it into first gear with no clutch. And then I dumped the clutch, put the clutch down, and put my foot on the brake as hard as I could. And at the same time, hit the throttles wide open. And it went, Wah! like this, and the clutch free. <laughs> Talk about shape tree mechanic. So, uh, interestingly, I, I have a similar problem on a little... 19, late 1950s sports car, one-off sports car, so clutch is stuck on that. Um, and so I was listening um, to every detail of your story, thinking, oh, this is what I need to do. And then it suddenly got way too complicated for me to attempt. <laughs> so I'd probably end up in a hedge. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, I, um, I, want to, I wanted to just sort of go back to the late 60s, 67 um, in particular, because it was really your, it was your first introduction to spa and it was it wasn't with a porsche but it was with a gt40 and i think the fastest thing you had driven up to then was an e-type at alton park where you you but you went to test it you broke jackie stewart's lap record by one and a half seconds and then raced it on the weekend and won you then stepped into a gt40 at spa and that must have been an enormous leap in performance yes i think it was actually 66 because with peter Sutton. I did Spa 1000 Ks in 66 and 67 yeah. in his GT40s, two, two different bars actually. And yes, I mean, that is true. I mean, I, I actually, in 66, I was racing a lower T70 Can Am car, <laughs> you know, pretty powerful. Yeah. And I'd driven it on most of the British tracks, Silverstone, pretty quick. And so, you know, when I got to Spa, I didn't really have any, uh, you know, bad thoughts about it or anything. But I go out in this GT40 on the Friday afternoon, and I nearly retired from racing on Friday afternoon because I couldn't believe how fast we were going all the time, you know, in this GT40. And I've got no barriers either in those days. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. You know, but, Mr. Sutcliffe doesn't like me to mention this, but in 66, we actually had a very good race. We were fourth overall among the Stall the Works cars. And so after the race, uh, Peter said, ah, well done, Brian. And I said, oh, thank you, Peter. He said, you have seen all the empty Coca-Cola bottles up and down the pit lane? I said, yes. He said, be a good chap. Collect them all and get the money back on them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you watch it, it's a typical Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah. oh, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a different world, wasn't it? I mean, really different. The, 
Uh, but it was that it was it was a couple of years later that you then uh, after the race on the Nurburgring Sudschleife, um, you you were approached by Ferrari. That I mean that earlier in your career, it must have. How did that come about? Well, it came about because uh, in early six, of course, in you know, I turned professional in '67 uh, for David Bridges, one of the three motor racing Bridges brothers. Charles, who started me, Red Rose Motors with the E Type in '65 and then the Lola T70 in '66. At the end of '66, Charles said, I'm cutting back a bit. Uh, but David's looking uh, for a driver, and so I went to see David in Garstein. And they said, you want to turn professional? I said, what does that mean? He said, it means I'll pay you 30 quid a week, guaranteed for a year, with a car and a mechanic. So that's how I turned professional. That was 67. Well, you know, I'm doing Formula 2 now. Um, I'd really never driven a single seat until I was, you know, 30, pretty well. But anyway, we've been doing reasonably well. And then I'd gone to drive David Piper's LM Ferrari, the uh, Paris 1000Ks, the 250 LM with Richard Atwood. It poured with rain, pretty awful. But we did quite well. We, I think we were sixth overall and we won the GT class. And after the race, this tall, rather elegant looking gentleman came up to and he said, uh, Redmond, how would you like to drive with X at the Kai Army nine hours? November, it's only like a month away. That was David York. So then I'm now we won the race. And so I signed a contract with John Wire for 68, November 67. And so, you know, we were doing all right, really. And then, the, you know, Cooper Car Company asked if I'd like to do Formula One. They were looking for an inexpensive driver. And they were going downhill a bit at that time. But anyway, so now at the beginning of 68, I'm doing. GT40, the best dry long distance drive in the world, with the young Brussels Sprout. And we won the Pantap Six Hours and the Spa 1000 Ks in terrible rain in both races. And uh, I was still driving Formula Two in a, in a Lola T100. And so I'd have a, you know, anyway, we were doing, doing, that was sort of the flavor of the month. So I get a call from engineer Mauro Figueri at Ferrari. And you come to Marinello and then to Modena test the Formula 2, Formula 2. So how would I go? I meet uh, Mauro Trigari and the crew, and we test at Modena. And at lunchtime, he said, Brian, you see over there, under the tree, with the raincoat on? I said, yes. He said, this is Signor Ferrari. Because what he's really saying is, by hard, go faster. <laughs> so... <laughs> I get the drive, he says, you, right, we go to the uh, Sudschleife, Nürburgring Sudschleife, which is, you know, like the main Nürburgring, but shorter. It's about five miles instead of 14 and a half. At that time, Jackie Hicks is the team leader. So in practice on Friday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, the end of qualifying, I'd gone as fast as I could. I came in the pits about 10, 15 minutes from the end of qualifying. The guy says, why do you stop? I've gone as fast as I can. He says, Brian, you are in 10th place. Go out and try harder. <laughs> <laughs> so I go drive like a maniac. Well, I went one tenth of a second faster, and I'd never been in 10th place. So I was fourth all along, which is okay. So the race comes off, we go. And about the fourth lap, Perth Ahrens, who was a Nürburgring expert, was ahead of me. Uh, we were all in a bunch. And he put a wheel in the dirt in uh, turn one, effectively. I got showered in stones and rubbish, and one of them went through my goggles. It hit me what I thought was in my left eye. And I stopped, flung my arm up, flung my goggles off, and drove back to the pits. So I go about, you know, four and a half miles uh, with no goggles going, what the matter, what the matter? I said, uh -huh. He said, it's okay, it's okay. Wear your spare goggle. I said, I don't have any. He said, take X's. So he gave me Ix's dark green sun goggles, which were great in the sun, not too good under the trees. And I then drove, you know, like a lunatic. And uh, I was catching the leaves at two seconds a lap, set the fastest lap, finished fourth. I was just a fraction of a second behind uh, my friend Derek Bell, who was third. And then I got back into the old sport hotel, you know, and I just sat on the bed, my head in my hands, like, you know, thinking about it all. 
And then I went to dinner, and Ferrari disappears, he comes back. Brian, I speak with Signor Ferrari. For the rest of the year, you drive a Formula Dewey, and at the end of year in September, Monza, the Italian Grand Prix Formula Uno. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> what do you mean, no, thank you? I said, if I drive for Ferrari, I'll be dead by the end of the year. But, yeah. And but the <clears throat> the amazing thing is, that, you know, you're one of, I would say, a very, very small number of people who Ferrari asked twice. They don't tend to ask drivers twice, do they? But we'll, we can come on to that a bit later. But I think that that race, I think you lost, I'll, I'll get this wrong, it's either two minutes 15 or two minutes 50, replacing your goggles. And you made it all the way back to fourth. An amazing, amazing drive. But then after, you know, in late, it was 69, you signed for Porsche. And it wasn't an easy start because I think your first race was the Daytona 24 hours. And it was six weeks after they'd taken a bit of your hip and glued it onto your elbow after you had that terrible crash where you got your arm stuck between the car and the armco. Um, but Porsche never knew, did they? Even though you were in a sling. No, not likely. <laughs> I've just got a new driver who's going to pay me $1,000 for Daytona, Sebring and Le Mans. And it's seven hundred and fifty dollars for all the other races. I'm not. I'm not going to give that up. <laughs> <laughs> but you, obviously, with D Daytona with its banking, I think you. Do you not? You did you not have to wedge the steering with your knee or leg or something? Yeah, I, I held the steering wheel with my left hand and my left knee up like this. I supported it like that. My right hand on the top of the wheel in case I had to use it. I was just resting it, resting it up. Yeah, unbelievable. The thing is that this. This was before the 917. This, you know, the 908 was was the sort of the Porsche car of choice at the time. That's it was still very much kind of one of the manufacturers to drive for, though, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's no question. But when the uh, the CIS, the FIA changed the rules, they were trying to ban effectively big engine cars because the American Ford had won them on in 1966 and 67. And so the idea was to stop these Americans winning these big races. <laughs> and so they reduced the size of the engine for prototypes to three litres. That if you made 50, you could have five litres. They were thinking, you know, that let's say Maserati, Jaguar, Lamborghini would come in with modified versions of their streetcars or using the engines. But that never happened. And so they reduced the required minimum from 50 to 25. And that's how the 917 came about. Um, Porsche, I mean, it was just unbelievable. And it was all Ferdinand Pieck, of course. He was the whole driving force behind this incredible effort. Because they were building 25 917s. They built about 18 908s in a long tail and short tail farm. And pretty well early on in 69, they were building another 908. The 9083 built only for the Nürburgring and the Targa Flory. It was unbelievable because it nearly bankrupted Porter. You never read much about this. But it, and, uh, uh, yeah, because it's, you know, it's, um, I think, you, you know, it's very easy for someone like me to look back at sort of Porsche's success and, and in the kind of, I suppose it really in sports cars, it started with the 908 and then skyrocketed with the 917 when they got that sorted. And it's very hard to think of Porsche as a struggling manufacturer, but it, it very much was then, wasn't it? You know, especially very when the so. when yes, 917 first came out. Yes, in 69, only about half of Porsche's business was cars. The other was doing experimental work, you know, for other manufacturers. And other yeah. They weren't a major car manufacturer. The whole, the whole thing was just unbelievable. Mm. But 69 was what an amazing year for you 10 rounds of the world sports car championship and and won five of them with with joe siffer um in in that 908 but joe i think you obviously got on very well with joe yes he was a great guy he was you know he when after he'd uh, been killed at brands hatch and we went to the funeral enrico steinemann the team manager of course at that time in 69 there were 10 factory drivers Six Germans, three English, Rick Alford, Richard Atwood, and myself, and, uh, and the Twits, Joe Zippert. And so uh, Rico Steiner said, the only among amongst you guys that has any business sense is Joe Zippert. 
now we are not good. But he was, a, he was a fantastic driver as well, I think. Yes. Yeah. He was, he was, we went he, after Daytona, which I know that was my first race, where I drove with Vic. Uh, Rico Steinemann came to me on the Monday morning after the race weekend and he said, Brian, would you like to be number one in your own car and you choose the co driver? Or will you go as number two to no seven? And I thought, boy, you know, I think I'll win more. I knew, you know, that if I went with Sifford, we'd win more races. But I also knew that I'd get no, you know, none of the Corbett's. It would all go to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened. Even today, I read yeah. the story. I say, yeah, right. Well, I was actually there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, because the, the, the 917, I mean, it's such a sort of well told, told story. So I don't want to sort of dwell on it for too long. But it, you know, it's, it's incredible that such a kind of when the 917 first came out with the aerodynamic instability and it was obviously it was it was horrible to drive did you did you drive that early version before they sorted the aerodynamics i did uh, although i avoided the very early bit because one day in march of 69 i get a call from inviting isaac edmund you will come to isaac and test the new 917 and i'm in cone and it's you know it's miserable and wet and Old March 1969. I thought, why do they want me? You know, when they've got six German heroes living in Stuttgart, ready to die for the fatherland. So <laughs> I said, I, I, I need to make some arrangements. I'll call you back in 30 minutes. Please be sure to call her in. I called Joseph in Freiburg, Switzerland. And Steppi, have you tested the new 917 yet? There's a long silence. He says, no, no, Brian, he said, we let the others find out what breaks first. <laughs> so unfortunately, I couldn't go. Yeah, but it's, it was an incredible turnaround because that car obviously went on to such great success. But actually, it was, you know, interestingly talking about Joe Siffert there, it was in 1970 that you sort of decided to retire. I know, with, you know, four months later, you were, you were back. But what, why, you know, after what an incredible season in 1969, there must have been some very large things that made you want to retire only a year later. Well, I mean, 70, we had a pretty good year in the 917. Um, it was just, and I felt at the time, because I'm pretty stupid, I don't know. I mean, when I was 16, I was at a boys' boarding school in the north of England, Rossville, and the headmaster called me into it and he said, uh, Redmond, I suggest you leave school. We can't teach you anything. So I left at 16. So leaving the John Wire official Porsche team in 1970 was also really stupid, but I'd been offered this job in Johannesburg. And I, always, and I felt, and I still do to some degree, that earning a living doing something you love is somehow morally wrong. You know, and I don't think film stars and football stars should learn, you know, the enormous amounts of money that they make doing something they love. And I, I just felt it's not really the right thing to be doing. I'm totally really stupid. But anyway, off we go to South Africa. <laughs> and I came back in early time. It's very important. We got raided by the police one night, apartheid problem. <laughs> and so after the police had left and uh, said, tomorrow we're going back and one day, these colored black people are going to turn around and see off all the white. And so we come back. In March of 1971, I don't have a drive. But Sid Taylor offered a formula of 5,000 from McLaren. And in April, I get a call from Don Wyatt. Redmond, would you like to do the Targa Florio? Because Sifford and I had won it in 1970 in the 9083. And Derek Bell, who took my place, as he did at Ferrari in 1968, uh, had never done the Targa. And so I thought, boy, this is great, you know, a great chance to get back into the big time. So I go to the Targa and uh, Sifford crashed the car pretty hard the day before the race. And the mechanics worked on it all night. Sunday morning, we go to the start and normally Sifford started. And Wyatt said, uh, Redmond, I'd like you to start the race. I said, what for? He said, I don't want Sifford and Rodriguez knocking each other off. <laughs> so I started, and right from the start, handling wasn't normal. There was something funny about it. 
and 22 miles into the 44 mile circuit, the steering broke in a pretty steering easy corner. And ignoring the advice of engineer Helmut Flegel, who said to me before the race, Herr Edmund, if you must have the accident, do not crash on the right side. <laughs> So I hit a stone kilometer boat right in the fuel tank on the right side. It exploded. And uh, somehow I was so lucky because Siffert and I had practiced driver changes like 12 times the previous day against the watch. And I stood up, I hit the safety belt. It came under and I held my breath, shut my eyes, and I stood up. And I was on fire from head to foot, soaked in fuel. And I just jumped, you know, and somehow landed on the road and got some spectators took me to the side and the fire only went you know there was i got no assistance for 45 minutes before the uh, helicopter came and so i was blind of course by this time and the, I, nobody knew where i was and so for about 10 about 11 in the morning another english driver the inimitable alan de Cadene, is dragged in and he's had an enormous accident on the main straight when something broke on his Lola 210, and it caught fire. He was, he was very lucky as well. He was dragged out by a spectator. And so he's there, and he, he can't see out of one eye, and I can't see at all. And we're in a little, there are no real wards. You know, it's, it's a little, it's a hovel, really. And so, uh, unfortunately, I, I was bandaged from head to toe, hands, my face, everything. I had to ask Alan's assistance parts water. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so about 10 at night, uh, Richard Atwood and Pedro Rodriguez came in. They'd been looking for me. Nobody knew where I was. And so they took me back to the Porter Hotel in Chapelou. And there was a doctor with the Porter team. He gave me painting stuff. And then the next day, Porter and the Gulf rented a jet out of Geneva. And they took me to Manchester. I should have come to the main Burns unit, but he was closed with infection. So I finished up at uh, Christie's in Manchester, which is a cancer hospital, but they have a private wing. And there I was very well uh, treated, you know. So anyway, and in some ways, it's, been, it's pretty good because you don't look at my face now. It, you know, it's not all that line, <laughs> is it? It's all from the plastic <laughs> surgery in 1971. <laughs> so, it is astonishing, though, that because, you know, you were so you know you're so good on the targa um and you were so good at spa and these you know these circuits that were just so dangerous but so i guess you know it's all it's very easy for the you know for us nowadays to look back and say oh, oh god it was dangerous but at the time I, I think you obviously knew it was dangerous but you know it wasn't it wasn't at the forefront of your mind when you peeled out of the pits was it by the time you got to leaving the pits it, you know you yes, didn't cross your mind god. i mean a few years ago i was talking with david hobbs and i told him i said boy when i was at spa i never slept the previous night because i thought i'd be gonna be killed the next day he said you what i said yeah he said well if i thought that i would never have raced <laughs> well, it's a it's a fair point brian <laughs> the fact you weren't sleeping but then still racing yeah well yeah. 71 of course only about four weeks after the accident i raced again in sid taylor's m18 at uh, mallory park but then you, you won, didn't you? i was rubbing on the skin here and the doctor said you've got to take time off eight weeks off so i went i bought a trailer a 20 foot caravan and towed it to the south of France. And uh, and so there, well, one Monday morning, I've been up to the watch place, brush my teeth and one, and I'm coming down, and the English camper said, uh, he was going up to the watch place, he said, do you know that guy who was killed yesterday? And I said, who? He said, Rod something. I said, Rodriguez? He said, yes. Ah. Oh. Well, I got back to the caravan and I was in tears. And then he said, what's the matter? I said, Pedro is dead. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, yeah. back from the old trip, back into Cone, uh, Lancashire, and saw Siffert die at Brands Hatch in that non-championship Old Mill One race. <laughs> but anyway, going back to 71, you know, there, so at the end of 71, things are not looking good at all. You know, the M18 McLaren wasn't very good in the 5000 series, which was okay. And that had the fire on the Targa Foreo. 
And Sid Taylor borrowed a BRM Canon that was built for Georgie, Canadian stores millionaire. And he says, we're borrowing this BRM and we're going to Wimmela. So we go to Wimmela, 500 k's, and it's raining. And uh, we had a great race and lapped the field. And after the race, engineer Marathon, which included a factory Ferrari, they reckon it's only in a 312 PB and various McLaren, Canon cars, uh, Peter Gethin, and other you know, notable drivers. So for Gary comes up to me, Brian, what are you doing next year? <laughs> I was doing great years back into the big time with the Ferrari 312 PB. Yeah. Yeah, you're one of the very few people that Ferrari asked twice. <laughs>an interesting one here from <clears throat> Stefan Seidler <clears throat> he's asking what was more fun was it sports cars or Formula One I didn't enjoy Formula One I had a singularly miserable career in it really but my big thing of course was Formula 5000 in America for Jim Hall of Chaparral and Carl Haas the Lola and the Hewland Gearbox import for North America those four years 73 four five and six with uh, that team were fantastic. It was a fantastic four years. I mean, even the great Mario Andretti finished second for two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, a, there's another question here from Jim Foley that's, um, sorry, not from Jim Foley, from Greg Ricks. Um, on, on that, he said, you know, you're obviously notably successful in Formula 5000. Did you ever have any interest or opportunity to try IndyCars? You know, uh, that's one of my big regrets. The other one is never winning the model. We met four times and could have won four times, never won. Indy, I, what happened there was in 1974, USAC, United States Automobile Club, they organized Indy and at that time all of their races were what we call roundy round races. You know, they're all over. And so in 74, USAC joined the SCCA, who were the organizers of Formula 5000. So suddenly, and it was a big jump in the, you know, in the, in the level of competition, in comes Mario Andretti, Alan Sassinia driving for Vels Parnelli. This major, major effort. They hired away my crew chief in 1973, Jim Chapman. And they, they were the only team with Firestone tires, so they had an advantage there. And also, you know, John, Johnny Rutherford, Gordon Johncock, all these big stars of USAC, IndyCar. And I was offered a drive in 74, and I turned it down because if all these USAC guys are finding road racing so difficult, it's going to be the same for me, you know, going to Indy. Uh, when I first met Bobby Unser, Pocono Raceway. The original race was called off through rain. We got a new car, the T400, and it wasn't any good. And so in four weeks, Carl has bought a used and crashed T332, the previous year's car. Jim Hall had rebuilt it. We came back to the second race with this last year's car. And I'm pretty well back. I'm like in 10th plate. But I come whistling through the field and coming into a, a tight left hander, there was a bit of room, so I go shoop, down the inside. And Bobby Unser came up to me afterwards. He said, Remnant, what the hell are you doing? Passing me going into that turn like that. I said, Well, you have plenty of room. He said, Is that the way you road race guys do it? I said, Yeah. He said, Okay, now I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then in 77, of course, I mean, you know, won the four, the three championships. I should have won four, really. But in 73, I missed two races. I was driving for Ferrari in Europe. And Jody Schechter won. I actually won five races. and He won four. But I missed two races, so missed the point. And Jody won. Yeah. But in 76, the end of 76, the SCTA, uh, because the crowds, the spectator crowds for Formula 5000 hadn't been as good, 
as it had been for Canam, which was finished in 1974. They said, okay, boys, put body work on your, you know, open wheel single seat 5,000 cords, and we're calling it Canam. It's a marketing exercise. I get to San Trevite in the late May of 1977. I've never seen the car before. But I know that, you know, prepared by Jim Hall, tested by the chief mechanic, Franz Weiss, who not only built the engines, but did the setup, he was a great driver as well. So the car would be good. I go out in it. It's good. I come in after 15, 20 minutes. Joe says, how is it? I said, it's good. What do you want, you know, to change the balance of the handling? And it was oversteering a bit too much. So I said, drop the front wing a quarter of an inch. And on the next lap at about 160, it took off at the top of the hill. And it came down upside down. And that broke my neck, C1, stretched his shoulder, stretched my breastbone, broke my ribs. The roll bar broke. I went down on the road. The helmet was worn away each side, like this. And the ambulance blew a tire on the way to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and when Marion arrived from England the next morning, there was a photograph in the Montreal paper, and it showed the ambulance up on the track with the two guys working on the wheel. The doors are open, I'm not looking too good. And the headline was a Redman anymore. Redman is dead. So you um you know, you mentioned there that you know it, it annoys you that you never won Le Mans, but with the accidents that you had and the enormous success you had, it, do you not look back and think, well, I'm here? You know, I'm telling these stories when, you know, you know, another, another, another day you might not have been. You know, the, I mean, of all the people, you know, there are lots of racing drivers out there who've had enormous accidents, but you did make a remarkable habit of it, of having very, very big ones. Yes, I do. I mean, <laughs> I've been tremendously lucky. That's how I look at it now. I think, boy, you know, and I think of all my friends who, racing friends who died, and in small, not always big accidents. You know, in Siffert's case, uh, he had a broken ankle. He was asphyxiated because the BRM was upside down and on fire. Of course, no fire accidents, the usual stuff. So I think that I've just been, you know, extremely lucky. Yeah. And what's talking, you know, going back to sort of the Porsche and that, you know, that manuf the German manufacturer. You drove for Ferrari as well, you know, really in a very similar era. Was it very different driving for Porsches in, in their sports car team and driving for Ferrari? Because you really did them back to back. Yes. Well, of course, as mentioned earlier, in 69, this was a massive Porsche effort, and it was run by Porsche, Rico Steinem and the team manager. But in 1970, with the 917s and the 9083, that was John Wire you know, running the official Porsche team, who I'd raised for in 68 uh, with the GT40. And so there was quite some of that really, I think, you know, first of all, it was, can you imagine trying to manage 10 drivers, you know, in, in the, with Porsche, with all that was going on, building the cars, I mean, like, I don't know how they did it. Of course, the six German drivers were always complaining that Sifford and I, Sifford and Redmond gets the best car. <laughs> so at the new American uh, there were two new 908s, flunders they called them. They'd seen that the Matra was faster in a straight line and they, they'd made a small straight-sized body. And uh, there were three flunders there and two of them were written off, one by Vic Alford and one by Joe Ziffert, my co-driver. And so, you know, what do we do? Well, we got the spare Porsche Austria 908. And we won with it. And after that, we didn't get so many complaints. <laughs> <laughs> they quiet, they quietened down a bit. It was, I mean, John Y was he was he was a big personality, wasn't he? Yes, John was great. Uh, he never. I deserved it a couple of times. He never gave me the full death ray, which he was well known for. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But was it was Porsche? Was it, I suppose in some ways was it, was it an easier team? To race for than Ferrari because whenever I we did a series on racing for Ferrari last year yeah. and the kind of overriding message was how wonderful Ferrari was to drive for but really just there was or, there was always politics there's always always has been and there, you know always will be um yeah. did, did you find that Porsche versus Ferrari uh, not really I mean it was run by Peter Shetty sweats similar to Rico Steinem who was also sweats and that both were ex-drivers, et cetera, et cetera. They both did a good drive. I didn't see very much of the well-known, you know, Ferrari politics and everything. The only thing that did happen in 73 at the Nürburgring, uh, 
thousand Ks. I'm with Jackie Hicks and uh, Teodoro Mattario and Carlos Pacci are together. Now, before the race, I think it was engineer Cagliari that was in charge of that particular race. And he said, no, if a Ferrari is needing at the halfway point, no other team Ferrari must try to pass. So, Hicks and I are leading at the halfway point. Well, next thing that happens, right in front of the pits, Matsari, I go, hurtling past Hicks. <laughs> now there's a big fight, you know, for two laps, they flat out, bam, bam. And Matsari, had to stop for fuel uh, just before the end of the race. And he came in and they said, get out, get out. And he grips the wheel like this and put his head on the wheel. <laughs> and the two of the big guys have forced his fingers off the wheel and hauled him out. <laughs> <laughs> he was so mad that he wouldn't attend the prize giving. So Carlos Pacci, though, was second. Mazzario, Mazzario uh, refused to attend the, the victory podium. <laughs> so yeah, that's the only politics that I saw. You know, so. Yeah, the it's, you know I, I mentioned in a in a in the introduction that <clears throat> Porsche has obviously won the more more than any other manufacturer. Did I? You know, I'm looking back to you know, the 908, the 917, and then we'll talk about the 935, and, you know, and then obviously the 956, the 962, and, and the, the more recent 919 hybrid. I guess, does all that success, it doesn't surprise you that much, I wouldn't have thought, if, if you knew, you know, how good those, those early Porsche cars, sports cars were. No, I think, you know, when you look back at the Porsche history, uh, of all the manufacturers, they've been by far the most consistent in their support of motorsport and their insistence on using the racing uh, techn technology that eventually comes into the road cars. For instance, the 908 in 69 and the 917 in 1970 both had synchromatic gearboxes, which are not good for racing cars. It's so easy to miss a shift, you know, which is what happened to Joe Sifford at Le Mans in 70 when we were leading by four laps, 32 miles. And he missed a gear. You know, he came. He came out of the uh, chicane by the pits. There were three slower cars having their own battle, and he dives right across towards the pit lane and the pit lane, and right in front of the Porsche pit. Well, heard the engine go. You know, because the, the nine seventeen engine would go to eight thousand four hundred for forty hours, and if it went once above eight four, it broke. Went for a more than eight four, and so the Porsche um, use of racing in developing the technology for the streetcars is un unparalleled, and the support it is unbelievable. And probably a very long time ago, I went back to Isla test two thousand. It was the Penske winning car in IMSA. And I couldn't believe it because my last time at Nightshark was 1971. And then it was just a couple of huts and, you know, not much. And now this is in probably 15 years ago. Unbelievable buildings, even buildings for the transporters. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. They're, they're an, an amazing company. Now let's just pause proceedings there to thank our partner, Princess Yachts. Princess Yachts has been a long-time supporter of Motorsport Magazine, and we are absolutely delighted that they're on board as a partner to this podcast series on Porsche. Much like the one with the green cover, Princess Yachts epitomizes the very best of British manufacturing, and this company does incredible things on a daily basis. You really must go and check out their website at princessyachts.com. Uh, we've got one um, from Jenny here, which is quite nice to obviously talking about Porsche. Um, which race did you enjoy the most in a Porsche? Spa, when it was over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wondered whether you might say that. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'd, I'd, I'd probably agree with you on, on that one. Um, and there's, there's a question here from Jim Foley. Uh, you were a fixture on the vintage circuit when I raced. Are you still? Um, I don't know whether you, you remember Jim Foley. Um, but he obviously saw you racing. Uh, <clears throat> you, you still, as far as I know, you still do lots of demos and, and bits and pieces and 917s and things like that, but you, you don't race anymore, do you? Well, I did a little bit each year up to last year. Um, I actually have my 61st racing license. But really, you know, at, at, uh, let's say Goodwood and the Revival, I, I, I've i never really raced like I'd like to race because you're driving other people's valuable cars. 
you know, like say Peter Levan, this is Aston Martin BR1, you know, stuff like that. And so also I recognize that now if I try to do what my mind is wanting me you know, to go, that I'll probably make a mistake and make a mess of it. And so when I raced today, I'm really just driving in a race. Oh, it's okay. I've been doing that all my life, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't race. I tend to drive around in circles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, I just, you, you were talking about Enzo Ferrari before um, and the fact that, you know, you were told that he was sat under the tree on the other side of the circuit. Am I right in thinking <clears throat> that he only ever said two words to you in all your time <laughs> at Ferrari? Yes, it was in 68 during that time down at uh, Maranello and Modena. I went to lunch with Ranello, and there were probably 40 executives and engineers in the dining room. And uh, Senior Ferrari was at the far end, and I came in at the door, and he stood up and he came walking down the passageway towards me. Of course, the whole dining room goes completely silent. Then. And on, slightly behind him, on each side was engineer Mauro Figueri and engineer Giacomo Cagliari, and he stops in front of me. And he's quite tall. I didn't realize, you know, that. And I'm not sure what to do. And I start to raise my hand, shake hands, and he shoots his right hand out like this. He gets hold of my cheek here and shakes it like this. And then he spoke the only two words he ever said to me. Nice a boy. <laughs> <laughs> not very encouraging, is it? <laughs> oh, I suppose it, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah. It's astonishing, to be, you know, flanked by two people. It's like something out of a, a Fellini movie or something. It's, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I'm, he must have played up to it a bit, I think, you know, yes, yes. played up to the, the myth. Um, now, before I, I've got some sort of very Porsche related questions um, that I'll save for, you know, for, for 10 minutes, but I just wanted to ask you about what, what you're doing now because you're, you're about to, you're nearly off on the car rally. Am I, am I right? Um, well, about 30 years ago, uh, my career, racing career was pretty well over, and I was at a vintage race in uh, Virginia. And a friend that I'd made in vintage, uh, Don March, he was a BMW dealer in Columbus, Ohio. And he said, how are you doing? I said, well, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle, really. And he said, well, why don't you start a club? And I said, well, how do we do that? And he said, well, you know, this, this, and this. Uh, two or three meetings a year. Um, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, you start it and I'll guarantee you 10 entrants for the first event. So that's what we did. And here we are, this coming weekend, we have our 30th year at Palm Beach International Raceway. <laughs> Amazing. Incredible. Yes. So yeah. how many are there of you next week? Well, you know, due to the uh, COVID and also to the weather situation, in the mid and north of America, uh, the numbers are down from last year. But last year we had 45 entrants and about 100 cars and a total of about 120 people. And this year, uh, right now, we have 36, so we're nine down. But we've reached the break even point. Right. <laughs> so, We've got a good group coming, but of course, you know, we're concerned about the weather up in the north, all these snowstorms and uh, the terrible weather. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've had it here now. Uh, there's um, in in this series, I'm sort of I'm asking all the, everyone that I I speak to sort of similar questions. Um, what, is there an engineer or a team manager at Porsche that kind of stood out for you? Um, you know, when when you were racing for them, it might not even be when you were racing for them. It could have been before or after, but. Is there someone from the technical side of Porsche that you thought was particularly talented? Uh, well, there were so many of them. It was the, the one that I dealt with pretty well all the time was engineer Helmut Bott, who was the head of engineering for Porsche. Uh, he was a very nice guy. And I think he got pretty well destroyed at Porsche with the 959, you know, the who technical challenge was so great. But in fact, he was a, a brilliant guy and a nice guy. But at the end of 69, with these 10 drivers in the team, he said to me, Brian, you are our favorite driver. I said, really, Herr Boss? Thinking, you know, you are the most smooth, you are the most da 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 da. He said, yes, Brian. He said, you are the only one who never complained. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> not, not you're the fastest one or you're the easiest to do and then you know, never complain. Yes, I think, but of course, you know, although it wasn't really in my time, Norbert Singer, of course, was really fantastic. He yeah. The, so many of the cars, the 956, okay, 962, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I only really knew him through the 1979 Le Mans, because, as you know, as mentioned, the big accident in 77, I hadn't done a lot of racing in 78 or 79. But I get a call from Porsche in about April, not perhaps of, of 79. Aaron, Edmund, you were right to buy Le Mans with Jackie X in the 936. Wow, big time. So we do the Silverstone six hours, Jock and Mass. Jackie couldn't come, but Jock and Mass is my team. Well, about three or four laps from the end of my stint, the brakes are starting to feel a bit dodgy. And so I, I didn't want to go in right then, because if I go in now, Jock and won't be ready. You know, I'll have to do another stint. So anyway, I whistled down to the club with about two or three laps to go. No brakes. I go, I'm going 180 miles an hour. No brakes. So I tried to spin it. You know, I'd rather go in backwards. In those days, they had catch chanting. So I wah, as it goes, it goes wah, and then boom, and I'm going straight again. So it had hit a post. It had hit the catch and see post. And into the pits, uh, they do the brakes, they put a new tail on it, and we're still in the lead when Jochen goes out. <laughs> so on his first lap, as he comes into Woodcote, 180 miles an hour, the body flew off. And they had an enormous accident. So now it's yeah. Le Mans. So on my first lap at Le Mans, Jackie's done the first session. I came through the chicane. The car didn't, the 936 didn't feel right. But I've got a fraction of a second to decide whether to go in the pits or carry on. And I, you know, I didn't even think I carried on. So now I turn into the Dunlop curve at 180 miles an hour. I turn in, spin. What I felt in the second part of the chicane was the left rear tire going down. So I was spinning around the little curve. I had the body coming off, flipping from my life flashing before my eyes. And then I'm heading up the barrier like this at an angle. I think, oh, didn't hit it. And I stopped at the uh, Rouge, where there was some room, and we carried a big toolkit in the 936. And I cut the tire off the rim with a pad saw, you know, a hacksaw that's got uh, tape around it. Yeah. And then drove on the rim, on the grass, as slowly as possible, back to the pits. We've now lost, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. And it's going again. So about one in the morning, I'm up above the pit with my old friend Ian. The rain is pouring down, thunder, lightning. Little television on the screen side. X is stopped on the Mulsanne. So the um, drive belt is broken. Next, 15, 20 minutes later. It's just going again. We carried the spare belt in the toolkit. It's just it. Now it's going again. A couple of minutes later, it's just stopped again. <laughs> He's now at the Meltan corner. Stop. So the vote, this spare belt have broken. So now I know we're definitely out. Half an hour later, Hicks is going again. The car comes into the pit. I look down. Norbert Singer looks up, waves. I go down, I shake hands with Ian Green, thinking my last time on earth. I drive, you know, it's hard, and the weather up to eighth or tenth place, you know, we're gaining all the time. The rain, down the motor. Suddenly, 45 minutes later, out of sequence, pit signal, pit. I go in the pit, a singer leans over, he says, Air Edmund, he said, you can get out of the car. We were disqualified one and a half hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. The mechanic had taken a sandwich. Ix was hungry, and he'd taken a sandwich and thrown it across the track. Oh, my oh, goodness. Fortunately, the pit marshal, the marshal saw the, the spare fuel pump drive belt. <laughs> <laughs> it's there obviously there was quite you know quite soon after that the, the 956 was born and the, the 962 and and they really were kind of such a huge success especially with all the customer racing because you know if you were a customer you, you ultimately had a chance of a chance of winning if the factory faltered did you ever did you ever try a 956 or a 962 did you ever test them or have you driven them since um, yes, I actually did Le Mans in Avernes Schuppen. Of course, yeah, yeah, of yes, course. Yes, yeah. uh, Of course, I mean, I also finished second 
And that picked up 24 hours in yeah. uh, Jim Busby's BF Goodrich car. We should have won. And, you know, some, we all made some mistakes. Bob Wallach and uh, Mauro Baldi. Uh, my biggest mistake was I'd had some business difficulties with a certain Thomas Morgan tour. And his Jaguar, which was leading on uh, Sunday morning, was going slowly. It was slowing down with some uh, mechanical problem. And I came off the banking at turn four, you know, we were doing about 200 miles down. And uh, I cut it a bit too close when I went past the Jaguar. And I felt a little nudge no, like this. <laughs> and the next minute, my right rear tire came past me. Um, I'd cut the tire, and yes, uh, so. You know, we lost a bit of time with that, but all of us had some problems. We thought the second was okay, but we should have won, really. Yeah. But they were, they were <clears throat> hugely successful cars, the 956 and 962. They, um, is that because they were easy to drive fast, or is that because they were just fundamentally a, a brilliant design for a racing car? Well, it, it was typical of, well, of the Porsche's immense success was reliability. I mean, Porsche built all of their cars so well. In fact, IMSA, in 1980, wrote new rules in America uh, for GT prototype to try and break Porsche domination. Porsche had only been raced for four years, except one, yeah. the BMW one. And so Porsche, the, just the sheer engineering skills, I think, that they put into everything, or there's no, there's no, other, no other car like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> just to go back to sort of these sort of quick-fire questions I've got, um, to sort of to wrap things up, um, was there a Porsche driver? You mentioned there were, you know, there were ten of you on the roster at, you know, at any one time. Was there a Porsche driver that you you rated particularly highly? Well, probably of the he wasn't. It was probably Rolf Stommelen, I think, at that time. But he was pretty young as well, but extremely, uh, extremely talented. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And what's um. Did, have you owned any Porsche road cars or driven Porsche road cars that, that stick out over the years? Well, in 1969, I get this message from uh, Redden, you must choose the specification for a 911S that we are going to lend you. So I choose, you know, top of the line and I go out. It was about February of 1969. I collect this beautiful silver with blue interior 911S. Uh, that I used all through the year. At the end of the year, we could we had the choice to hand it back or to uh, buy it, two thousand know? pounds. So I bought it, and and, uh, and Sid Taylor wanted it. You know, I'd been driving actually in '69 in a lower G70 Mark III B, and so I sold it to Sid. And a few weeks later, I got a call. It says, Brian, Brian, it has the car been crashed? I said, No, no, why? He said, well, when you get to 140, it weaves them out all over the place. <laughs> I said, that's what they're like. And actually, in that car, we'd been to the BRDT dinner in 69. And we're coming back up the M6, and it's about midnight. And it was a cold, frosty November evening. There's nobody on the road, nobody on the M6. And I'm cruising along at about 110, something like that. And I come around a curve somewhere near the Birmingham turnoff. And there are two police 3.8 Jags with the uh, drivers talking in between them. And as I came, because I'm trying to slow down without breaking them, I see them running to the car. So what do you do? So I thought, <laughs> now I'm doing 150. I'm doing 150. And they, they're some way back, but they're not dropping back that much. And I came over a blind brow, and straight after it, there was an overpass. And I braked at the last minute, you know, I jumped down the, the slip road. I've got on the other bus, turned everything off. You've <laughs> 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 routine again. And I drove very quietly back through uh, the northern Birmingham and Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Amazing. Different, <laughs> I, hope, so I, did, I didn't think you'd get away with that now, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> no, today you'd be history, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, the, I, I, I'm still slightly sort of shooting myself in the foot about the fact that I forgot that you drove the 956. But um, talking about sort of road cars, but now converting to the race cars, 
You drove so many, the 908, the 9917, the 935, 936, the 956. What's, which one sticks out for you? Which one, which one would you, you have in your garage outside? Well, I think probably a, a 962. Of course, the 962 only came about because the 956, you sat a long way forward. And John Bishop put in, so wouldn't allow that. He said the driver's feet have to be behind the line drawn through the center of the wheels for safety aspect and that's how the 962 came about and so i'd probably choose a 962 i mean it's a fantastic reliable typical port you know easy to drive comfortable you know amazing amazing car yeah you would you probably wouldn't even need to turn up to the top of the hill outside gargrave to get it get a clutch <laughs> unstuck either no no that was uh that was uh very funny <laughs> yeah well, Brian, it's been the most amazing hour. It always is chatting to you. There's so many stories, and I always feel as if we sort of slightly scratched the surface of all your stories. But um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been truly in insightful um, and wonderful to hear about all those all those great Porsche memories. But enjoy your rally next uh, next week, and I hope the weather um, stays good at least. Yes, I hope so. Yeah, but Brian, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of you who've been listening, you've been watching. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed this episode and there are many more in this Porsche's winning formula series. We'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.